This is Ancient Classics, and these are the top five classical dogs. At number five, we have the Hound of Hades, Guardian of the Underworld. Yes, it's Kerberos. Not only our most famous ancient dog, but one of the most well-known and instantly recognizable of all classical characters, and a staple of popular culture. We all think of him as the three-headed dog whose bark is perhaps a little more deadly than his bite. But his ancient depictions are much more varied than that. Not all accounts even agree that he had three heads. Hesiod can't even seem to make up his mind as to whether he had 50 or one. Many depictions substitute or add snakes heads for dogs and give Kerberos a snake's tail. And he may even have in some manifestations actually been a giant snake and not a dog at all. But back to Hesiod and his one-headed Kerberos. Now, lest you think that sounds all very underwhelming, well, I'd argue that he is actually the most sinister and creepy of them all. There stand the resounding halls of the underworld god of mighty Hades and dread Persephone, and the terrible dog stands guard before them, pitiless. His is an evil kind of cunning. When someone enters, he fawns, cringes with his tail and two ears, but then prevents them from leaving, watching over them, devouring whomsoever he catches as they make their way back out the gates. But why, you ask, is Kerberos only at number five? Well, he might have had all those extra heads, and so is at a great advantage to our other canine pals. But from the number of heroes who get past him, drug him, or even abduct him, he's pretty useless. So, thank you, Kerberos. Next. In 79 AD, Mount Vesuvius erupted, engulfing the area around Naples. Everyone knows what happened to the inhabitants. Men, women, children, and yes, dogs too. Hundreds of years later, from the 18th century, the sites were excavated, revealing the cavities left by the eruption's many victims, but also better preserved than anything else from ancient Rome. So many urban wonders, houses, gardens, libraries, paintings and mosaics, and our next featured dog, guarding its home, known today as the House of the Tragic Poet, still keeping watch after nearly two millennia. At number four, we have the Kawe Kanem dog. Yes, there's something a little cute and twee about this dog, but I think there's also something profound. Kawe Kanem, beware of the dog, it's perfect. Maybe this is why it features in so many Latin textbooks. It's grammatically simple, and its literal meaning perfectly aligns with its actual meaning, its usage. It means what it means. And that meaning is easily explicable by reference to nothing more than basic grammar and vocab. Hell, you probably don't even need that. This dog instantly tells a story, speaks to us, and for me that really builds bridges across time and space. Back in the day, most dogs were first and foremost working dogs. Our last two candidates performed one of the two key traditional canine roles. They were guard dogs. Our next three, however, performed the other. They were hunters. But first, I'd like to introduce you to one of my favourite Latin poets, a man hailing from North Africa, Carthage in modern-day Tunisia to be precise, Marcus Aurelius Olympius Nemesianus. He's the author of four pastoral poems and we'll feature him in an upcoming video. But our next dog, or rather, dogs, are the stars of his other poem, the Kinegetica, which kind of loosely translates as the Latinized Greek for stuff about hunting and dogs and stuff. The Kinegetica is a didactic poem. Now, didactic poetry is a genre which is epic-adjacent, written in the same hexameter verse form and sharing many other common generic features, but purportedly of an instructional nature. Famous didactic poems include Virgil's Georgics, all about farming, Lucretius's De Rerum Natura, a kind of philosophy slash physical sciences slash didactic epic crossover, Aratus's Phenomena, I can't say that word, all about stars and astronomy and stuff, and, well, you get the picture. None of them are of much instructional use, but that's a whole other story. So, Nemesianus's Kinegetica needs to be seen within that tradition. About 130 of the surviving 325 lines focus on the breeding, raising, and training of dogs. It's not the only or even the longest surviving poem of its kind. A guy called Gratius also wrote one, but I'm on a kind of Nemesianus trip, so yeah, we'll go with him. 
But first, time for a trigger warning. Anyone who came here for puppies might want to fast forward to number two. Nemesianus explains the cruel conundrum faced by all dog breeders of the time. A female dog will usually have a litter of many puppies. But if these young pups are to be reared to be good working dogs, only the fittest, most promising can be allowed to survive. All the others must be culled. Otherwise, the mother will not have enough milk and they'll all grow up weak and scrawny. I'm sorry to bring up puppy slaughter, but that's just how it was back then. And for the record, I'm in no way encouraging such practices in the modern age. So, how does one pick out the best puppy of a litter? All newborn puppies look equally cute and weak and helpless to me. The answer is, of course, to trust a mother's instinct. Make a ring of fire with a wide circumference and let the flaming smoke mark out a suitable circle, just enough so that you can stand unharmed in the middle. Gather up all the puppies, the whole crowd of them here. This will be a sure test of a mother's love. Trusting her sound judgment, she'll save the healthy pups from terrible danger. For after she sees her puppies surrounded by flames, with one great leap she'll cross the burning bounds of the danger zone, and in her maw she'll grab one first and carry it to the kennel, soon another, and then another. Thus the mother will take care to separate out the best of her offspring by her love of merit. Don't blame me. Take it up with Nemesianus. Like I say, the didactic genre was epic adjacent. And epic is, of course, the highest of genres. So it is only fitting that our top two dogs are epic dogs. One had superpowers, the other a bit like Batman is all the more epic for his lack of them. At number two, we have Lilaps, the trusty hunting companion of the hero Cephalus. His superpower was that no prey could ever escape him in the hunt. So, when the Thebans were terrorised by a monstrous baby-eating fox, one endowed with such superpowers that it could never be caught, someone had the bright idea of nominating Cephalus and Lilaps to hunt it down. That's all well and good, but tell me, what happens when the dog that can never be eluded tries to hunt the fox that can never be caught? It's the kind of paradox that would have challenged any Greek philosopher, but the gods were not ones for philosophy. They knew that such a conflict could lead to nothing less than a cosmic meltdown. Ovid, narrating through the voice of Cephalus, describes what happened next in Book 7 of his Metamorphoses. The crest of a hill rises up over the fields below. I climb up and from there I take in the sight of this unprecedented chase. One minute the beast seems to be caught, and then the next it escapes from harm. Nor does the cunning fox flee in a straight line, but it eludes its pursuer's bite by running round in a circle, depriving its enemy of any means of attack. But the dog is insistent and chases at a like pace, and it's like he's grabbing the fox, but no, he's not. He just bites the empty air. So I try to help out with my javelin, which I balance in my right hand while fitting my fingers into the thong. I look away, and then, when I take another look, there I see, wow, in the middle of the plain, two marble statues. This one you'd think is fleeing. That one you'd think is catching. For sure, it was a god's desire that both should be unconquered in their race. These listicles are always so subjective, and one risks upsetting people by leaving out their favourites. So, let us know in the comments who you think should have made it as a runner-up in this top five. Runner-up, I say. As for number one, there can only be one top classical dog. And I think you know who it is. Not only the greatest classical dog, but the greatest of all time dog. And number one, it's Argos. After 20 years away, Odysseus returns home in the company of his loyal swineherd, Eumaeus, who is not yet aware of his guest's true identity. For, disguised as a beggar by Athene herself, no one recognises Odysseus. No human, at least. There lay Argos the dog, covered in ticks. And when he realised that here, nearby, was Odysseus, he wagged his tail and flattened both his ears, but didn't quite have the strength to approach his master. But looking aside, Odysseus wipes away a tear, hiding it with ease from Eumaeus, and then he speaks. Eumaeus, what a sight! That dog lies in a dunghill, yet he has such a fine form. 
but yet I don't know for sure whether his speed of foot is a match for his beauty, or whether he is like those house dogs whom their masters keep for show. Then Eumaeus the swineherd spoke in reply, Indeed, that's the dog of a man who has died in a far-off land. But if that dog's form and deeds were such as they were when Odysseus left him, when he went off to Troy, then you'd be amazed to see his speed and strength. For no beast from the depths of the deep forest could escape him, though they tried to flee. He was a master of the hunt, that dog. Yet now he's beset by misery, and his master has perished in a far-off land, and the heedless women take no care of him. So he spoke, and they entered the house of fine living and went straight to the hall amongst the noble suitors. But the dark fate of death seized Argos. No sooner had he seen Odysseus in the twentieth year. Those are the top five classical dogs. Next time we'll do something a little more serious and technical. Until then, if you enjoyed, like and subscribe, and we'll be back soon.